Hey folks, this is Raniac, welcoming you to the start of a brand new Let's Play. Let's play Language Select Screen. No, not really. And the return, the happy Rainbow Armadillo, which means that we are in for a game of true quality. And I'm not being sarcastic in the slightest. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Let's Play The Adventures of Tintin, Prisoners of the Sun. A 1996 action adventure game developed by Infogrames for the Super Nintendo and a direct sequel to Tintin in Tibet, which I LP'd a while ago. Let's jump straight into the action. So this game's story kicks off with seven explorers slash professors slash archaeologists in deepest darkest Peru searching for the one true Paddington Bear. That's not what I'm looking for at all, by the way. The Sanders Hardiman expedition, but they couldn't fit that on the screen so they called them Sanders Hardiman, which is kind of odd. They found it at last! What did they find? My charisma? No, that's been buried deep beneath the Earth's surface. That's never coming out again. We have more chance of finding Shergar's remains than that. No, no, no. What they actually found was Rascar Kapak, an ancient Peruvian mummy, aka he who unleashes the fire of heaven. And the professor's reward for finding this mummy? To contract the plague, basically. And that's where we go straight into the gameplay. So our first stage is this museum, and right away we have a cameo from a character from a previous Tintin mystery, Professor Cantano, who's one of the seven victims. It's kind of nice to throw in a cameo like that. It's not very nice for Cantano, however, because he's basically catatonic right now. So this first stage basically just introduces you to the gameplay, which is very similar to its prequel, Tintin in Tibet. Tintin runs with Y, jumps with B, and can move into the foreground and background as he pleases with the up and down buttons. There's not too much to avoid here, but the enemies are kind of odd. We have museum guards, which I suppose makes sense. But then we also have Dr. Nick cosplayers and little girls with swing balls, which apparently can harm Tintin. Is he made out of rice paper in these games? I'm seriously beginning to think that he is, because the stupidest things injure him. And in the cartoons, he's actually quite a strong-willed and uh, courageous character, so I, don't, I, don't, I have no idea why Infogrames chose to make him this week. Possibly just for the convenience of the gameplay, but we'll see. Now this room is completely pitch black, but if you press A near this light switch, the lights will turn on. Unfortunately, this museum clearly didn't pay its electricity bill in the past 20 years, because the lights only remain on for about 15 to 20 seconds. There is enough time to get from one end of the room to the other, but be careful, because if, if you go too fast like that, you'll land on the spikes that are jutting out of just about every crate in this room. And there's Thompson, or possibly Thompson. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about them later, but first we have more dodging Dr. Nick cosplayers and museum guards do. No more little girls, I believe. And now the, the Dr. Nick cosplayers have a pallet swap. This is completely redundant. Why on earth did they choose to give them bottle green jackets now? As I said, this stage isn't too bad, really. It's just dodging people. I refuse to call them enemies. They're not enemies, they're people. And another victim, Dr. Mitch. Paging Dr. Mitch, you've fallen into a deep coma. All that's left now is to move back over to the left here, dodging a few more people. Again, I refuse to call them enemies. And we need to speak to the bumbling English detectives, Thompson and Thompson. That's Thompson without a P and Thompson with a P. And that's the whole joke that no one knows which is which. Different surnames, and yet they're brothers. And they tell us to go and see Professor Terragon. At least her didn't call him Professor Five Spies, because that would have just been terrible. And ridiculous. And speaking of ridiculous, I'm running out of time on the first level. That's not good. So inside here should be Professor Terragon, but instead, it's our old friend, Professor Calculus. Who tells us that Terragon's gone out, and he'll introduce us to. He'll introduce us to him. And then we skip straight into Terragon's mansion where we have Professor Creepybeard here, aka Professor Tarragon, being introduced by Calculus, and Snowy is clearly being perturbed by something. Nobody? I think it's your beard that's doing that to him. It's kind of putting me off as well, if I'm being totally honest. And Tarragon just basically tells us that there is a curse associated with Rascal Kapak, the Peruvian mummy. I mean, come on, mummies and curses, they've got to give like fish and chips. Like, Sylvester and Stallone, you know what, scratch that last one. And the curse basically says that anyone that does this is boned. And according to Infogrames, crack is spelled without a K and is the sound of lightning hitting the house. That's not actually lightning, it's, it's more like an explosion, it's kind of hard to explain, but seriously, minus F 
for English spelling, Infogrames. I know you're a French company predominantly, but this is unacceptable. And also, I'm kind of being harsh because I think it was like that in the original cartoon comic. So our second level is Terragon's Mansion, and we have a mystical ball of fire that just zapped the hell out of Terragon. And this is our main hazard. This ball of fire will fly around the room, basically causing stuff to drop. Although these black masks will actually drop of their own accord. You want to stay crawling around on the floor as much as possible here, because the ball of fire can't hurt you directly. And also, as long as you keep your distance from all the obstacles that are dropping, or, you know, just run straight into the ball of fire, because I'm an idiot. We also have creases on the floor here. They will cause Tintin to trip. Now, tripping doesn't actually damage you directly, but it can cause you to either get hit by hazards, or get hit by the ball of fire directly. So you want to be crawling wherever possible. The only time you don't want to be crawling is if the ball of fire conjures up a hazard for you to avoid. There you are, there's the trip. Like this lantern light, gas light. And you also need to watch out for the black masks. Another thing about this stage, it's kind of a maze and ouch. Yes, saying ouch when I get hit, that's brilliant commentary. It's kind of a maze and it kind of reminds me of that one stage in Bay Bay's Kids. This is not a good thing because Bay Bay's Kids was a terrible game. It's been well documented as to how terrible Baby, Baby, yeah, I can't even say it. Baby's Kids is. And I'm going to run out of time again. It's running out of time going to become a... God damn it. And you've got to be really careful here, because the ball of fire will come for the mummy, and you have to try and jump over it like that. And the mummy has been vaporized, apparently. And Terragon's translation basically says that we've unleashed the wrath of God on himself upon the seven professors. And during the night, this strange Indian man smashes a crystal ball in Terragon's presence, and now he is also catatonic like the others. And Dzing is not a word, by the way, in Vagrames slash her J. Because again, I think these cutscenes are mostly taken straight out of uh, out of the original book, but I could be wrong. This story, of course, is based on the book Prisoners of the Sun, and also its prequel, The Seven Crystal Balls. And here we have a bit of traditional Cuthbert Calculus silliness where he mishears what we say for comedic effect. And now in the third level, which I suppose we could call Terrigan's Estate Calculus. What are you doing, buddy? Oh, you're not going to do what I think you are, are you? You totally are, aren't you? Damn it, Calculus! Have you not seen The Mummy Returns? If you see an ancient bracelet that was on the wrist of a mummy, the last thing you want to do is put it on. Also, by the way, time was actually still... <laughs> Still going on in the cutscene, so that's kind of nice of the game. Not. Now, press the up button to haul yourself up these branches, but be careful on the way down. Because some of these branches will actually crack, and one thing they added to this game that wasn't present in Tintin and Tibet and was all the better of the game for it, they've added fall damage. If Tintin falls from too great a height, you'll take he'll sort of scream and you'll take damage. One, one hit of damage, I believe. And now we're being shot at by an unseen gunman. But fortunately, this game now gives you the opportunity to play as Captain Haddock. What you want to do here is get to some cover as Tintin, press down to hand the background, then press the X button, and you can control Captain Haddock. Captain Haddock has a, a couple of actions. He can move, obviously, he, he can move quickly with Y, and if you press B, he fires at the gunman. Then you want to press X to switch back to Tintin, who hides in the, in the background, switch back to Haddock, and so on and so forth, ad nauseam. It's not a bad stage, it's certainly not a bad stage compared to some of the later stages, because goddamn, some of them are just brutal. Especially ones that try and give us a different gameplay element. This, this game, Infogrames clearly didn't learn from their past mistakes with Tintin and Tibet, because in that game, and here don't fire because there was a whoa, yeah, this is not going so well. Ah. You can just jump the bullets, as I'm doing here. You know what, I'm going to have to waste a bullet just to get through here. You want to pick up that stick. Okay, because that stick is vital to finishing the level. I know it doesn't look particularly vital right now, but it is. So as I was trying to say before, I was rudely interrupted by the unseen gunman. You've got to get through here without getting shot, and Haddock has a limited supply of ammo. I'm pretty sure we're actually, he's actually running out, so any time you're not being shot at, such as there, you want to uh, conserve Haddock's ammo. 
but pretty soon you're going to come up to a point where you can't take Haddock with you any further. I think we're just coming up to it now. As I say, it's not a bad third level. It's kind of annoying in, in certain places. I think here... Yeah, there you go. He says, I'm out of ammunition. Go on without me. And this is probably going to lead to the first death of the LP already, but I'm going to give it a go. So we're now tinted on his own. And that didn't work. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, we're back here. And I've actually lost Haddock one screen sooner than I would have done, and I'm kind of running out of time again. This is definitely going to become a... You know what, let's just take this hit. I'm not too bothered about taking damage here, because unfortunately, there's actually a... Well, fortunately, actually, there's a one up here. And if I got to that without taking any damage, it would have completely replenished my health. But I didn't, so, hey, first death of the LP. Now, once you've not got had it, you can either tank damage like a mofo, like I seem to be doing here, or you can try and jump the bullets. This is not going well at all. And when you're getting into the level here, what you need to do is run up to this thing, then duck so the damn thing can't hit you. Then press the A button, and you'll whack the good man's hand with the stick, and the level is over. This game also has a password system, and here's our first password. And in fact, that is the perfect place to leave this first video. So thank you for watching the first part of Let's Play Tintin Prison of the Sun. Join me next time, as the screen transitions way too fast for me to speak. Join me next time for the second part, where we take a hellish car journey and continue our search for Cuthbert Calculus. Until next time, bye for now.